prior to the start of the session, this is the uh, logistics announcement for those Finnish speaking participants who would prefer to listen to these last two sessions in their own mother tongue, kindly go and uh, collect your headphones from the right outside the door of this, from my left, the door on my left outside there, and it's marked the channel one is for the Finnish. So for this session, and then the one that it follows immediately after the final panel, there will be interpretation from English into Finnish. Thank you. Okay, can you, uh, dear participants, find your seats quickly, and then we can get started. And this is a sort of a wrap-up session we are at now. Every uh, session regarding the four Tampere conclusions, each having two, had two workshops, have had a rapporteur sitting in on them, and now they will be giving Five minute, five minute only summary of what has been discussed in that particular session, key findings, key suggestions. So I give floor, the floor to Marie de Sommer from European Policy Center to take over this session. Thank you, Kielo. Yeah, this works. Uh, to reiterate Gilo's uh, points already, we, we've had a very ambitious time schedule throughout the conference, but this is by far our most ambitious session. We have five speakers and 30 minutes. Uh, the idea, however, is to really keep it short and sweet, to give you some uh, key pointers, key messages, uh, potentially key points of controversy that have come from the different sessions, also to enable you to get a bit of a flavor of uh, potentially those sessions that you weren't able to attend because we had a, a parallel working time uh, structure. We will not have time for Q&A in this session, but let me uh, use this opportunity to instead remind you that we very much see this conference as well as the notes as a collaborative exercise, as a, a process of dialogue. So please do uh, stay in touch with us, the organizers, via email or otherwise to share your thoughts. We have five distinguished uh, members of the Odysseus Academic Network with us who have kindly agreed to take on the tasks of uh, the short messages. Uh, I'll introduce them one by one as they present uh, their respective sessions and I kindly remind them again of the crucial issue of staying within five minutes. Uh, first up is Daniel Thum, uh, professor at the University of Constance, who will be reporting on the financial framework session and the agency session. Please. Indeed, thanks. These two themes were absent from the debates in Tampere two, 20 years ago, and that may have been a wise limitation. At the time, as Prime Minister Lipponen reminded us in his keynote speech, he said, if we had discussed finances, we would never have concluded the Tampere European Council. Today, the situation is, of course, different. We all know that decisions on the multi-annual multi financial framework are forthcoming, and it looks as if Justice and Home Affairs will be one of the big winners and will receive more funds. At the same time, the panel reminded us that we should remain realistic. The overall amount of the EU budget will remain at a bit more than 1% of GDP. Thus, the justice and home affairs slice will necessarily also remain limited. And this entails that the member states will retain the brunt of the responsibility to finance migration policies. EU money can support the member states, but it cannot undo their residual responsibility. Moreover, the Commission representatives told us that it can be attractive to throw more money at Justice and Home Affairs to distract from the absence of legis legislative reform. In other words, money alone cannot fix the deficits of the asylum system in particular. We also need legislative reform. Regarding the structure of the budget, there was widespread agreement that more money should be given to justice and home affairs, and there should be more flexibility in the allocation of funds. Other aspects are more controversial. A prime example is conditionality, which links the funds to the rule of law, and the rapporteur 
Professor Goldner Lang argued that such provisions on conditionality will only work in practice and sustainably if they are politically accepted by the member states concerned. She also reminded us that the internal allocation of funds remains, uh, reflects controversial policy choices, while the external budget on development and the neighborhood is quite massive. Internal funds for human rights compliant asylum procedures and reception conditions are limited. In another key mode earlier today, former Commissioner Vitorino told us why the topic of the second session, that is agencies, is so essential. He said one of the lessons learned since Tampere is that legis legislation alone is not enough. It has to be implemented in, on the ground. And this brings us to the agencies, which are the best instrument we have to close the implementation gap through European action. And uh, this implementation gap, we all know, it's epitomized by the deplorable state of the Greek asylum system. The dynamism of EASO and Frontex, which we discussed, is, of course, one of the most fascinating developments in EU law. And the Frontex representative told us that at this very moment, they seek to hire 750 new staff. That's, I think, a telling example and quite impressive. At the same time, the dynamism of the Asian cheese raises formidable practical and legal challenges, and these challenges include the tension between the operational and the supervisory function of the agencies, which have to control a system they help sustain at the same time. Also, there are internal governance issues. If the agencies are torn in a tension between independence and accountability, and our rapporteur, Lilian Zurdi, made some practical suggestions how to improve the situation. And while the Frontex regulation has been reinforced repeatedly, EASO reform is awaiting adoption. And as a result, EASO is currently working on de facto tasks which legally are at the margins, if not beyond, of its mandate. Finally, the composite nature of both agencies, which combine national components with, an EU, with EU actions, this composite nature raises its complex challenges of legal control by courts or by other institutions. Um, we discussed corresponding solutions, and for anyone who wants to learn more, I highly commend two excellent reports by our rapporteurs, which both managed to present a highly technical and complex development field of EU law in an understandable manner. Many thanks. Thank you very much, and thank you for keeping the time. Next up is uh, Professor Jens Vestet Hansen uh, from the Aarhus University. He'll be talking about the panel sessions on migration and development and the partnership framework. Please. Thank you very much. And I would like to begin where Daniel ended by saying that we had two uh, excellent uh, reports or background notes as a starting point for, for the discussion. Um, and I think the discussion showed uh, the narrow connection between the, the topics uh, and the analysis of the two background notes. The first one was on uh, migration and development. Uh, and here it was a main point of the background note, as well as the discussion actually, that um, Tampere uh, has been implemented or understood uh, in a way that has often put main focus on root causes which uh, reflects a flawed and oversimplified perception uh, of the phenomenon of migration and a similarly uh, simplified uh, or distorted approach to uh, migration management. Uh, as regards development issues, this has uh, sort of uh, resulted in defining an aim uh, that is preventing migration and the means have often been to set up conditionalities of development aid which, uh, as the background note uh, points out, often results in diverting development assistance from uh, non-sending states among which many are among the poorest. So it is in one way distorting the whole purpose of, of development aid as such. When it comes to the uh, global approach and partnership framework, one of the main points of the paper and also of the uh, presentation in, in yesterday was uh, the tendency to confuse border controls and migration management. 
which in turn also leads to the conflation of the two policy areas uh, and the practical uh, measures taken uh, in these regards. This in turn results in the increasing tendency, which is known for all of you, of course, towards uh, <coughs> extraterritorial migration controls being carried out, which uh, often uh, raises challenges to human rights, not to say outright uh, violation issues. And also, according to thorough statistical analysis of the background note, actually could seem to be out of proportion to the true nature uh, of the um, problem of irregular uh, migration. Across the two uh, sessions, we had some common observations and some common concerns. One was the overall tendencies to this distorted approach to migration policy, which presupposes or assumes that migration is a, is, is, is a problem that has to be stopped. Uh, but as one of the panelists yesterday pointed out, it is rather to be seen as a phenomenon to be managed. And there were various uh, uh, constructive proposals for uh, alternative approaches, such as a more proactive or uh, creative uh, kind of measures towards uh, attempts of circular migration, emphasizing the impact of, it, of remittances uh, as an investment uh, source, and thirdly also to, to, to work more on the interconnection between uh, skilled labor recruitment and uh, educational programs. The second common observation was about the impacts of these uh, uh, third country partnerships on uh, international relations. The very idea of setting up conditionalities uh, in the context of international development assistance can be seen as ir irreconcilable with, with the idea of partnerships in the, in the true meaning of the, t of the term. Next, the lack of respect for, uh, or rather, the extraterritorial migration controls which are being imposed on uh, neighboring uh, states, not least in Northern Africa, will often be resulting in a kind of disrespect for emerging uh, regional or sub-regional free movement regimes in uh, Africa. Uh, and that altogether also means that um, the various measures or mechanisms employed uh, in, in, in these uh, th uh, third country partnerships will often be of a kind of extra, extra legal nature which in, in, in principle and sometimes also in practice can be seen as challenging the principles of the rule of law as we have seen for instance with the EU-Turkey uh, arrangements. Two final meta observations. Um, one is that uh, it was pointed out that uh, there is a sometimes dilemmatic uh, relationship between research and policy making. And we had some interesting uh, comments on that uh, in one of the panels yesterday, where it was pointed out that, that as long as we realize that we have different roles and should be working independently, then there may be actually, as I think this event has shown, uh, good preconditions also for having a mutually beneficial uh, relationship between the two fields of activity. The second observation was that it was pointed out uh, that there is a need to widen research perspectives. Not least as lawyers, we tend to be very Eurocentric, uh, obviously. I'm among the sinners here. Uh, but it was pointed out that there is a need not only for independent research and more, more research, more independent research, but also for research which is sort of widening uh, the perspectives towards migration narratives and issues beyond Europe. Uh, so that was one of the sort of reflections uh, which I think we also ought to share here. So finally, I don't think we can conclude any need to revise or amend tempera, uh, but there could be lots of reasons to reconsider the ways in which uh, the relevant uh, points in the tempera conclusions are being implemented and transformed into uh, actual policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to Jean-Yves Carlier, professor at the Université Catholique de Louvain, who will be talking about the legal migration session and the integration of value session. Please. Yes, this workshop was about fair treatment of third country nationals. And the first session was devoted to legal migration. The background report was written by Professor Case Grunendijk, Emeritus Professor of the Radboud Universiteit Nijmegen in the Netherlands. 
The second session was devoted to integration and values with a common background report from Professor Ilke Adam, Freie Universität Brussels in Belgium, and Professor Daniel Tim. I have not to introduce him again. I must say that the most important contribution to this workshop is, in my view, the content of these background reports, which I will not summarize. You have to read them. <laughs> Let me share three points with you, starting with the second session. The discussion was quite controversial on the notion of integration and the word integration itself. Should we talk about integration, disintegration, inclusion, exclusion, insertion, etc.? There was some consensus that beyond the world, what is important is what do we need? And the majority answer was the capacity to participate equally to the society. And this is a process that must be done as a joint process, a two-way process like it was said in the background report with civil society, local authorities, religious communities to build bridges. To support this, the Commission could propose a new comprehensive plan of equality, which is broader than integration. It will therefore be more about action than legislation. This leads me to the second point and the first session. The most important discussion on legal migration was probably this question. Do we need new legislation? Do we need recast secondary law? Some consider that the situation is no longer the same than 20 years ago. Other, such as the author of the background report, consider that we could focus on better application of existing law. I share this view. But as a way of action, it was also said that the Commission could develop pilot projects with serious evaluation and assessment, for instance, for self-employed migrants and here maybe with legal sources or for waters of legal migration. And my third point is a personal remark. Several participants mentioned the importance of keeping the spirit of temporary, even if temporary was 20 years ago. They are right. And this spirit should bring us back to the first workshop and the need of a global approach and the question of the role of EU and that EU could play in the evolution of the global compact, which was not mentioned at all in the discussion of our workshop. Why this issue of legal migration and integration are on the agenda of the global compact for safe, orderly and regular migration. In the same spirit, more than 65 years ago, in 1952, one of the founder fathers of Europe, namely Jean Monnet, in one of his speech in Washington, said, and I quote, six European countries have not committed themselves to the great undertaking of breaking down the barriers that divide them to raise higher barriers between them and the outside world. I leave you with this. Thank you very much. We move over. <laughs> we'll have a chance to thank uh, all of our excellent rapporteurs at the, at the end. We move to Professor Rebecca Stern, uh, who is joining us from the University of Uppsala. Uh, and she'll be speaking about the SEA sessions and the Dublin and Solidarity sessions. Please. 
Thank you. Uh, this is sort of a challenge since the second session ended about what is this, an hour ago, and uh, I was working through the coffee break with this, so it might not be as structured as the previous presentations. Um, but I wanted to share with you some of the, what I found was some of the key messages in these two extremely rich sessions with two extremely rich papers that I encourage you to, to read if you have not done so already. Uh, I will treat the sessions together since they very much talked about the same things, but from perhaps different aspects, uh, from, from, from different perspectives. I'd say that uh, the first of the key messages I would like to share with you is the um, emphasis uh, that was put on um, the value of fundamental, on fundamental values and principles, including the rule of law, that we need to identify which are the fundamental values on which the system is based and should be based. And it was pointed out in the first session that the lack of compliance with fundamental values is a main reason to why the system is in a gridlock. We need to go back to basics, uh, in a way. Uh, solidarity is, of course, a key concept, or perhaps the key concept. You could perhaps even summarize the discussion in the two sessions with one word, and it would be solidarity. However, uh, what solidarity means can be discussed, and this was also one of the main themes throughout these two sessions. Is it symbolic? Is it substantive? With what and with whom should one show solidarity? And we are not in agreement, I think, on this point. Uh, allocation of responsibility was also a key theme with ties in with solidarity. It was pointed out, uh, in particular in the second session on the Dublin system, that allocation of responsibility does not only has to mean a sharing of people, which we all agree upon is difficult. Uh, it can also be other things, such as, that, for example, financial um, sharing of responsibilities. Uh, the second key message I would like to share with you is that implementation in practice of existing law is a key issue. Differences in interpretation of key concepts must be harmonized, protection gaps must be addressed and closed. And mere changes of, legislat of legislative documents won't lead us anywhere. Uh, a bad reform, it was stated, uh, is worse than no reform. I certainly agree with that point. And this was true both in case in relation to the common European asylum system and to the Dublin system in uh, particular. So just making something new might not lead us to somewhere good. Third key message is that trust in the system, both the SEAS and Dublin particularly, must be re-established, both within states so that they actually apply the rules that are in place, and with uh, asylum seekers so that they might not like the system we have, but at least accept the way it is implemented and uh, works for them. And on that note, it was stressed in the sessions, both sessions, that we need to work with those seeking protection, with the individuals seeking asylum, not only punishing them for not following our rules. So perhaps we need to look for a more inclusive system, a system that is not only top-down, but also uh, looks upon those who are the subject of the system. Uh, talking about individuals, uh, that leads us into the issues of controversy that were discussed during these two sessions. Um, one major issue of controversy was uh, the issue of secondary movement. How should this be handled? Uh, root causes to secondary movement must be addressed, and if we want to uh, counteract secondary movements, should this be used by using sticks, as is the case today, or should we try more to use carrots? Looking into what could be legitimate reasons for secondary movement, what would be the incentives for asylum seekers not to move from one country uh, to another. Um, a key element of this discussion on secondary movement is the issue of free choice. Um, we could talk about that all day. Uh, it's an extremely controversial concept and difficult in many ways. Uh, you could perhaps summarize that the point of view of member states is that free choice is good in theory, but it needs to be balanced with some kind of foreseeability and control on the part of the member states. In another perspective, increasing the element of free choice might lead to that a lot of unnecessary transfers are avoided and a lot of human suffering is also avoided. It should also be kept in mind, and this was uh, pointed out 
um, that um, secondary movement or free choice uh, needs not to be a question of one or the other. There is a middle ground to be found between the, the position of state parties and individuals, as was pointed out by Francesco in his, his final remarks. Um, perhaps, I know that I have no time left, but perhaps this discussion in these two very rich panels could be boiled down even further than these points that I've just mentioned. And perhaps one could say that it's about that we need to start with the principles and fundamental values. We need to agree on which these are and what they mean. And we need to take solidarity seriously. And in doing so, we need to strive for robust solidarity and to strive for an understanding of what this could mean that is le at least acceptable for all those uh, who are actors in this game. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to Dr. Madalina Moraro, who is joining us from Masaryk University and who will be speaking about the Schengen sessions and the return and readmission session. Please. Thank you, Marie, for the introduction. Uh, I have to start first by apologizing uh, because I realize I'm the last speaker, so I'll have to be extremely brief and I'll not make justice to all the discussions uh, in the two panels that uh, I assisted. We actually had a very rich uh, debate, and if I had to choose two buzzwords uh, for the discussion we had, um, these would be emotional and mutual understanding. And we had uh, four controversial topics. Um, first was the Schengen border court. The second was Schengen membership. Third, the recast of the return directive, and the last, um, return admissions. So what I would like to do is basically highlight the common issues that have come up through both of the sessions. And the first one would be necessity of legislative reform. So whether given the challenges on the ground, the best way forward uh, would be legislative amendment or maybe perhaps that it has been already emphasized in previous session and also uh, yesterday, whether the way forward should be actually enhancing effective domestic implementation. A second issue that was raised was the idea of conditionality between the two main immigration instruments, that is uh, Schengen and the Return Directive, on good performance in the uh, common European asylum system. Uh, this was very controversial and this is where the emotional came up in the panel. Uh, particularly the first panel on the Schengen. Um, and the main idea that came out from the debate was that such a conditionality would be harmful, um, and especially harmful for solidarity and trust. Uh, and maybe what should we concentrate for the future is on um, membership that is based on the proper implementation of the Schengen acquis. A third issue that was common, I think, for both sessions was the idea of how we measure effectiveness. Um, and that is effectiveness for um, border controls and secondly, effectiveness of returns. Um, the idea was put forward that actually in terms of returns, um, effectiveness should not concentrate only on the number of returns. Uh, but that we should look forward also for sustainability and also for human dignity, uh, which are key and important aspects to have in mind. Um, and also in terms of effectiveness for uh, Schengen, it was the main idea, um, and I think there was a common agreement, that we lack um, data and that there should be more research invested on actually measuring effectiveness um, on border controls. Um, and one, uh, uh, another topic that I think was very important is the uh, pending recast of the return directive. I have to apologize because probably I will concentrate and I speak more on the, the return because this has been the bread and butter for my research for the last five years. Um, and I had the privilege of actually being involved in a European project that has looked and compared the judicial implementation of the return directive in all 28 member states. Uh, so I can actually feed a bit more into the debate that was um, in the, uh, carried out in the panel on the return. Um, and one idea was 
the how do we actually look at the return directive and how do we um, deal with legislative reform in this field um, and the key word and the key idea to take home is that perhaps we should also go back in time and think at the moment of the adoption of the return directive. Uh, initially, when it was adopted, it was called the Schempfu Directive, as we all know, but with the help of courts, it has actually proved to be a normative example also for the Council of Europe and other states. So this actually leads me to the last point that I want to make with uh, the importance and the vital role of courts in upholding constitutional values, but also important principles in return uh, and readmission, and that is voluntarism, proportionality, and most and importantly, the respect of the rule of law. So uh, with this, I would like to end my summary. And again, apologize if I didn't make justice to all the insightful comments and presentation, but I would encourage you to actually have a look at the background notes. One of them was written by Marie de Sommer and the other by Thomas Molnar. They're wonderful papers that should be uh, disseminated as much as possible. Thank you. Please, no need to. Uh, yeah. No need to apologize. I think we can all appreciate the very difficult task we have given to you. Thank you to all five of you uh, for having managed to give such rich contributions in the very limited amount of time. I think we've all benefited. And with that, uh, please thank our uh, kind rapporteurs one more time, and I hand over to my colleagues. Well, thank you. That went really well. We stayed on time. Uh, while you uh, patiently wait for the final plenary to start, you might use your time and uh, tweet on the wall on what's been happening this morning. I'm sure it'll be much appreciated by those who are not uh, here personally. And we greet all of you who are watching this on live stream also. Hope you have enjoyed the morning morning's uh, wrap-up session, and uh, we are not timing now the, the, the change of the <laughs> cones, but uh, let's hope that they get here fairly soon. Thank you very much. I don't think that took more than five minutes either. So we are more or less set here. Okay. Well, distinguished speakers and dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, sad to say, but we are now coming to the final plenary of our conference. And like the opening plenary, the closing plenary is a little bit different. It will not be a panel. Uh, there will be uh, standalone uh, talks. 
and the chairperson, rightly so, with his long-standing career and vast networks, as we already mentioned earlier, is who else but Jean-Louis de Brouwer. Nobody else can do this. Thank you for coming to the podium again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way we do it, we first have the Commission and the European Union representative, and after that, we have two commentators. And then the chairperson will wrap up this session. Jean-Louis, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Welcome again in this room. Uh, it's an honor for me to be there to chair this session dedicated to concluding remarks. So indeed, we'll start by giving the floor to uh, two friends and colleagues representing uh, their respective institutions, Enric Nielsen and Tanya Fayon. Uh, Enric, we know that the uh, taking over of the, of, the, of the new commission will most probably be somewhat delayed. Uh, nevertheless, it is very obvious, just listening to the reports that we've heard, that the challenges are huge and that the Commission, as usual, will be looked at as the engine between the new developments. There are already some indication in the mission letter that was addressed to Commissioner Shinas and to Commissioner Janssen. I mean, there was also some indication at the occasion of their hearing and their written uh, comments. Uh, you can find also indication in uh, elect, elect President van der Leyen's uh, I mean, guidelines for the new commission, as well as in the strategic guidelines adopted in the strategic agenda, I'm sorry, adopted by the European Council in June. Uh, we are not going, of course, ask, to ask you to go beyond what the commission official can say, but we certainly would like to have some of the, some of the more documented views about what could come next from the college. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you very much, Jean-Louis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and uh, friends, uh, it's certainly a pleasure and an honor for me to be uh, here to speak on behalf of the Commission, on behalf of my Director General. Uh, I think the time has also come when it's necessary to give a warm thanks to the organizers of this very impressive event. I would say both uh, intellectually with this range of illustrious speakers and a rich program, uh, but also logistically with a flawless organization. Uh, that doesn't happen just by itself, so uh, my appreciation not just for the people on the scene, but all the people behind the scenes uh, that have actually made this uh, happen, which is very impressive. Uh, I've also been happy from my side to see so many colleagues from the Commission who have been able to come here and take part in the different panels, uh, which I hope has allowed us to absorb as much as we can the different ideas, the different views, uh, and the different discussions that, that we have had uh, during these two days. Now, of course, it's a challenge to give a, a speech in a closing session in such a rich and, and dense conference, because what on earth could there be left to say uh, after all these illustrious speakers are having covered basically all the topics of, of the whole migration debate? Uh, that would be, let's say, the difficult way to do it, to try to improve on that. Uh, but there is, of course, also the easy way to do it, and that's to pick up on some of the very clever things said by others and try to build on that. So I'll go for the easy way. Uh, first of all, and I think that's useful to remember, uh, the words by Madame Esia Konva yesterday uh, to remind us, and which we always need to do, that migration policy is about individual human beings, and there is a human story behind each migrant, each refugee, uh, and that's the basis that we always have to remind ourselves when we try to construct the bigger migration policy. Uh, I was, of course, also struck by uh, the words of, of Mr. Vitorino in his excellent introductory speech. Uh, he referred to justice and home affairs as an island in 1999. Uh, while now, 20 years later, justice and home affairs is part of something bigger, an EU framework accepted as an EU competence. Uh, that deserves to be noted. Uh, if I may add a modest reminiscence of myself, uh, I think we spent actually quite some years after the Amsterdam Treaty in 1999 getting comments such as, but justice and home affairs is not an EU competence, why are you doing all this? That did not stop in the year 2000, if I put it like that. That only stopped a number of years later. Today, I think that's over. Now it's accepted, EU competence, and we are uh, this conference is an example of how we go into the details, how we engage, and the massive amount of, of academic research that goes into this area. This is an achievement that, that deserves to be underlined. 
Uh, third, I would pick up in particular also on, on what the words of the former Prime Minister Paavo Lipponen said, uh, first of all to note uh, the main or the, the big global challenges that Europe has been facing since 1999 and which were not predictable at that time uh, with the very volatile neighbourhood and the security challenges that has influenced also the migration situation in Europe uh, and put our systems to the test. But Mr. Lipponen also stressed the need to focus on the good, uh, not just the missing parts uh, when we look back at Tampa and what has been achieved or not achieved. Uh, and I think that's really important to bear in mind. A small reflection from my side, if I did my counting correctly, um, and I would challenge you a little bit to see if you have these numbers in your head. Uh, I think in 1999, the Schengen area without internal borders consisted of nine member states. Nine. Even the illustrious member state of Finland was not a part of that area in 1999. Today we are at 26 states part of the Schengen area without internal borders. Uh, I think that's quite a remarkable achievement in only 20 years to have enlarged this new uh, project, this new experience, and, and uh, made use of EU competence in, in such a rapid way. Uh, we have heard several examples, I think, during the panels and in other uh, presentations uh, that we have now an almost complete acquis covering the whole migration and asylum area, uh, even an acquis that has developed in several generations, uh, which has also an accomplishment over the last 20 years. And as a third example, uh, perhaps uh, the most relevant one, if we look back just five years, uh, the main advances on the operational dimension, uh, the work of our agencies today uh, on the ground uh, in helping people, in helping the member states, I think would have been unimaginable 20 years ago. The same goes for the levels of funding that we have at the disposal of this still new policy area, uh, as well as the IT systems that I think Sean we flagged also in the beginning, uh, where there is more in the pipeline already agreed and about to be implemented. So the operational dimension, also a key example, I think, of, of main progress. Now, we tend, of course, when looking back, uh, to focus on, on 2015 as the dividing year. Uh, I would, and you might perhaps call me a somewhat naive optimist, uh, nevertheless insist on that you can also put that in a positive sense. Uh, so this newly established, newly enlarged Schengen area and this newly developed common policy survived 2015, um, a challenge which was not foreseen in 1999 and which I think nobody was prepared for. But it's still there. It has its strengths and weaknesses, and there's still a need for a lot of work. But we survived that crisis. So there was a resilience uh, in the system. I think also we drew a number of important lessons from 2015, uh, which, of course, I will not go so much into detail now. But uh, I think once again we saw, and that's the most important lesson of them all, uh, for this kind of crisis, the only way to deal with it is to do it together at EU level. Uh, any member state trying to act alone and trying to deal with the crisis of that magnitude will not manage. It is always better to do it together, and 2015 reaffirmed that once again. It reaffirmed the importance of partnerships with third countries, where getting out of the crisis, the EU-Turkey statement was uh, an instrumental part. And equally, it demonstrated, perhaps only as a first step, but nevertheless, that there is solidarity in the Union and relocation can work something which we are still demonstrating also this year, that it's something that can work in practice and be made to happen uh, on the ground. Now, looking a little bit more forward, um, here also I would refer to, I would say, the excellent presentation by Minister Ohisalo yesterday on describing the comprehensive approach to migration and asylum, which I think will also be and remain a guiding point also for the future, uh, that we need to have irregular migration under control, we need to ensure protection for those in need, live up to our values as they are stated in the Charter, but also ensure the return of those who do not have the right to stay and ensure that we have strict control of our external borders. We also need to further develop the legal pathways, legal migration, resettlement, and uh, equally important, continue to work on the external dimension, uh, building the partnerships with third countries, addressing the root causes, uh, and fighting against the smuggling and the trafficking that brings irregular migration to Europe. I think the key element perhaps to remember in the comprehensive approach is that all the parts are linked, they are all interlinked, uh, and it will not be possible to separate or to pick out one, let's say, favorite part of this and try to focus only on that one. Because that will fail not only in practice, because the implementation of all these parts are linked in terms of how they are actually implemented, uh, but also politically, how we develop these policies will need to go together and we need to address 
uh, all of these parts. Now, looking forward again, uh, as Jean-Louis said, uh, you are aware that President-elect has announced uh, her attention for the new commission to present a new pact on migration and asylum. Uh, it is her firm intention also to relaunch the debate on the Dublin reform. Uh, we do need a, a fresh start, a new impetus uh, in, in how we take that reform forward. Uh, we need to continue to look for common ground uh, and we need to base ourselves as much as we can on the unity among the member states, among the institutions, among the stakeholders. Uh, both uh, to keep the European project going in, in that sense, in that spirit of consensus, but also with a view to the future implementation. Solutions based on unity are better implemented than those that are, let's say, forced through uh, with majority voting. This is a fact that we know from experience. The first step, and that has also been a strong commitment of our new Commissioner-designate Johansson, uh, will be to engage in a thorough dialogue uh, and discussion and consultations with member states, with members of parliament, uh, the political groups, but also all other stakeholders. Uh, and that will be a very important first step for her to listen to all views and see how can we construct a new policy framework that includes all elements of this comprehensive approach in the right mix uh, and also identify exactly which legislative proposals from the Commission are needed, be it as new proposals, be it as relaunched proposals, uh, or which proposals would stay on the table as already presented uh, in the last mandate. So in that light, I think this conference has been uh, an excellent and very timely contribution. Uh, really, we take a lot of, of interesting things with us, uh, and I hope that uh, you will continue to engage with us in this consultation and dialogue to continue to feed your ideas as we continue our reflections uh, on how we preserve what we have built up, the Schengen area, the common policies, and we continue to develop it to fill in the missing pieces and then deal with the unfinished business uh, of the last five years. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Henrik, for this insightful synthesis of what was said, at least the main messages as you took them with you uh, during these one day and a half, and also for having been as far as you could uh, in forecasting what the next step of the Commission could be. Uh, it's now my honour and my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Tanya Fayon. When referring to the European Parliament, common sense now is to say, OK, the European ele elections have had an impact, not as dramatic as we thought, but there is a changing landscape within the European Parliament. Uh, clearly, the institution is determined to show its muscles. You shut down three designated commissioners, which is, I think, is a record. Uh, but on the other end, we all have in mind the splitted vote that took place two days ago on the draft resolution on disembarkation and interception at seas. Uh, the question is, of course, how much is this uh, sh uh, I mean, shaping the future agenda of the European Parliament? I mean, can you tell us more about how you see the institution moving on this area, which is so emotional, as it was said, and on which you are suddenly going to come back again, again, and again, and again. Thank you, thank you very much, and I think I can leave my papers aside because you raised uh, very important questions, and as we have discussions this morning on Schengen, future of uh, migration and the future of EU, where are we going on, some very important challenges that we have. But you started saying that the European Parliament is showing its muscles, that we managed to shut down the three commissioner designates. I wouldn't put it that bluntly. There was a reason for that. And <laughs> we are still waiting. Um, now I understand we have three new nominees there is another challenge that we uh, don't have a gender balance anymore, but um, let's see how the new uh, president of the commission will tackle the issue. And there are still some um, difficulties. We have to have the hearings. And we did all our hearings, I would say, at least for my political group, socialists and democrats, in a very proper way. Um, and we also demand still some changes in the portfolio and also with the titles that it comes. And as we are discussing migration, security and future of Schengen, I would like to point out that the, the title um, about European values, I find uh, very controversial. Personally, I find it's a, a very rhetoric that goes um, as a gift to the extreme right. Because what are the European values and how to connect migration and security under this portfolio. I think this is something that we should not accept with the new commission. And we also pass this message clear to the 
um, the, the next president of the commission. So this is one thing. Another is I am now third time back in the European Parliament and in the last uh, mandate I was in charge for the Schengen reform for a migration and asylum package, especially on um, criteria for the, the um, status, um, refugee status or subsidiary protection. And I was also in charge, still in charge for the integrated border management fund. Now, we had this morning an excellent discussion on the future of Schengen and where we see the difficulties the next commission will clearly face is um, I'm afraid that we will see Schengen hostage of the Dublin reform. And this clearling has been made already with the new commissioner designate. Um, and clearly during the hearings and also in her written answers, we've seen um, that as long as we don't have safe external borders, we cannot um, drop the interior border controls. Now, here I see the difficulty, what was also said this morning, when we will see really safe external European borders. This is a very important question, because I think we are in the last few years building a lot on security measures. We are strengthening our external borders with technology. We are investing a lot. We did systematic border check controls that are in fact, on the ground, not really functioning the way we wanted to see. We are in this situation having six Schengen member states that are now prolonging interior border controls. I just give you an example as I'm coming from Slovenia. Last year, Austria returned 39 people to Slovenia. So where is the argumentation for having for four years interior border controls? So we have Schengen at risk. It's clearly not functioning. This week, something else also happened. We got a positive evaluation on a border, uh, on a Schengen for Croatia. And I'm afraid it's quite a bianco check. I like to see positive signal to send out to um, other member states that, yes, we welcome you in Schengen. But we know that for 10 years, we are saying the same to Bulgaria and Romania, and nothing has happened. It's even worsened. It worsened also when we talk about migration, when we look at the situation. We as socialists and democrats, and I'm today representing, I have to say, the Libe Committee and our chair, Juan Lopez Aguilar, who is apologizing. He's not here today, but we have been working a lot on migration files in the last few years. That um, we always try to defend comprehensive approach. That was reflected in our migration resolution, uh, Mayola uh, King Metzola, you know it, um, how to tackle migration, how to make a holistic approach, tackle where there are sources of migration, how to make our borders safe, how to fight illegal migration. We adopted, in fact, in the last years, all necessary legislation that was on the table, including very ambitious Dublin reform. But it has been blocked in the member states for a while now, the same as Schengen. It has been blocked also. I would like to recall that also on Schengen, I was a rapporteur, we um, adopted an ambitious reform before the end of um, previous term. We reconfirmed the mandate now, but it's blocked in the member states. So we have quite some challenges ahead, and uh, I asked also the, the future um, commission or those that are in charge for those files first on Schengen. Is the Commission willing to take the member states, if we don't have a reform soon, to the European Court? As we see, it's illegal what is happening on our interior border controls. And uh, the, the answer was clear, it's not a priority. We try to discuss in a dialogue, we try to find the solutions. But if there will be in the future a clear link also with the migration and the Dublin reform, I am um, I'm seriously concerned especially knowing that you mentioned we have a lot of emotions and that I experienced myself during the election campaign, that we are living in a Europe, one minute left, that, <laughs> sorry, thank you, um, that this is a very politicized topic. It's a very abused topic, discussing migration. And in this um, environment with a lot of emotions, so with a very dangerous, I would say, populist nationalist rhetorics, that we are in a situation as politicians 
that we difficult to find common sense and reasonable solutions. And we are difficult being in a position to be courageous. So these are the challenges we face. And we will continue, I see, in the new European Parliament. We don't have clear majorities now. We are even more polarized. We will have most probably to find alliances um, from topic to topic. Yesterday, we had this unfortunate vote, I can say very unfortunate, on the resolution on how to resolve or how to solve or how to um, save lives in Mediterranean, losing for two votes. But I would like to say a lot of people, unfortunately, were leaving the room because it was Thursday. And uh, the, the other part of the parliament, or conservatives, were celebrating. They were celebrating the fact that we are willing to criminalize NGOs that try to help people. And I was yesterday actually very shocked to see that this institution turned that way. But I would like to ensure that at least, um, I hope in Libe, we were normally more reasonable in adopting a human legislating, legislative that we will also continue doing so. So this would be my message also to all of us. Tampere is still alive. I'm glad that we had this conference today and yesterday. I was not participating. But we should maybe sometimes remind us on the, where our roots have begun. Where is our strategic focus? It's the same when we discuss about the future of European Union. Throughout the crisis, we forgot what are our strategic goals in this integration process. And Schengen and our security and safety of our borders, but the freedoms inside, this is the biggest capital. This is the biggest investment. This is something most tangible people feel today. And for this is worth to fight. So um, this is my message at the end. And thank you to Finnish presidency and all organizers to inviting us here. Thank you. The time has now come to uh, benefit from the comments of two observers. The first one, Dimitri Papadimitriou, has been with us since the beginning. Uh, Dimitri, your voice and your wisdom have regularly crossed the Atlantic uh, to uh, provide us with the right nudges at the right moment. Uh, everybody in this room now how influential you could have been by expressing views, expressing opinions, being listened by the right person at the right moment. So needless to say that we would all listen very carefully to what your takes are from this conference. Uh, thank you, Jean-Louis. And uh, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists and all of you, because I've learned more in the past day and a half than probably the last several years of my life on this. Uh, I thank the organizers for inviting an outsider insider to sort of um, share a few thoughts. And, you know, when someone is a closing, or I'm, all, I'm only closing speakers, um, the task becomes both difficult and easy. The easy thing would be to just sort of add to the sort of enthusiasm for more of everything, uh, you know, more Europe better and more legislation, uh, more protections, listening more to the NGOs, worrying about all the people who are indeed um, dying in the Mediterranean and elsewhere, etc., etc. And that's too easy. And I never try to do the thing that is easy because we need to make progress, and progress is always messy. So what I will do is reflect on the event itself and try to see whether we can imagine together a future in which we make progress without forgetting that we need to bring along our publics. It's our right to be reinforcing each other, to be talking about more legislation, more rights, more this, more that, but if we cannot bring along our publics, we are not going to make lasting progress. So I'm going to say a few words about um, 
some favorite topics of mine, I guess. Um, the fact that, I'll start with the fact that we need to dig down from rhetoric to action. Rhetoric is easy. We're all very good at it, extremely good at it. But action is always difficult because it forces us to make difficult choices. And that's how we make progress, I think. Um, clearly, we can have incantations, as we have had in the past day and a half, about more solidarity, values, partnerships, common asylum and migration systems, etc. And the papers have done a great job in laying out what the opportunities are, what needs to be done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it seems to me that what we need more of is judgment, strategy, and pragmatism above all. And I will spend a bit of time um, to demonstrate, you know, the need for pragmatism. Um, if we're going to make progress, as we need to, we do have to be extremely pragmatic. Um, and I will demonstrate how pragmatism plays into some of the issues that we discussed in the last day and a half by demonstrating how many bridges we need to cross if we are to accomplish something that I think intuitively we all understand that we need to accomplish. Um, namely, to make IASO into an organization that can make decisions that we can all respect and implement. Well, this is a maddeningly complex task because it requires and it demonstrates how interconnected all of these institutions and their decisions are. And I think we must be realistic about the difficulty of all this interconnectedness. The ASA will have to be staffed up to an enormous degree in order to do some of the things that we think that they should be doing. In a difficult funding environment, as it will be in the next five years, it will need to be funded at a much higher level. Member states will need to actually adjust their regulations, legislation, or whatever, in order to be able to take advantage of this enhanced, more powerful, more independent, more thoughtful IASO. Its data systems, as we heard, will have to become interoperable. I don't know how um, you know, well known or understood that term of interoperability is. You know, in the United States, where we have a single government and have been in this business for a few hundred years, it has taken us about 15 years to actually make our data systems interoperable. We started in 2001. Now, most people will say we have a fairly interoperable data system. And also, in addition to that, have the people who make adjudication decisions what they need to do in order to make these decisions, which is all the information that's necessary about an individual, you know, a set of circumstances back home, et cetera, et cetera. This is, in other words, data and information in real time. And we can just meet for Tampere 3.0 20 years from now, and we'll say, okay, if we've really done extremely well, we have an essentially interoperable a data system. And of course, whether IASO can succeed or not will depend very much on whether other institutions within the Commission, within the Union, are also doing their job, and they are doing their job in a very synchronous way. For instance, IASO can make a decision about somebody who should receive asylum, but relocating 
those asylum seekers will require the cooperation of an awful lot of other organizations, institutions, and of course, of member states. And furthermore, if you know, IASO is to make decisions of that nature, who is going to implement the returns that are necessary in order for you, for the EU, for any country, the United States, any country, to actually have a functioning immigration system? Because that's what we're talking about, systems and immigration systems in particular. So we must, it seems to me, uh, allow ourselves, force ourselves to temper our ambi um, ambition with patience and pragmatism. And these are the kinds of things that I think all of us ought to be thinking about. But this is not the only thing that I wanted to say. I want to talk about a favorite topic of mine, uh, trust. We have heard here the word trust a number of times. But typically, in a narrow way, a trust between you know, an asylum seeker and the government, or an institutional kind of arrangement. But trust is a much, much bigger concept than that. The biggest casualty of the last five years everywhere, not just here in Europe, is the loss of trust. Trust among European institutions, trust among member states, trust between some member states and European institutions, between publics, the electors, and elected officials, across ministries and DGs, something that Jean-Louis and I and a number of other people have been trying to work very hard on for 20 years now, between publics and European institutions, between the EU and most or several member states and their partners. The use of language is extremely important. Do we really believe that we know what a partnership means? How do you have partnerships with sending out transient countries you know, under the conditions that we expect them to abide by and us to benefit from? So every time that you know, we think that somehow we have turned time is up, <laughs> you're killing me. <laughs> so let me say a couple more words, if I might, <clears throat> about <clears throat> um, I, I'm just going to have to just basically talk a little bit about two other things. <clears throat> Before five or seven years ago, we had people who didn't agree with us. They were slowly organizing themselves, but we didn't have something that we have had in the past five or six years. And that something is now all around the world. We did not have organized political parties, populist, nativist populist, nationalist parties, that are acting in a way that, in a sense, divides, already divided and polarized countries and tears us apart. And this is not just a European phenomenon. In the United States and North America, we have two very populist presidents. You only think, of course, of one of them because he's, okay, I'm not going to say anything, um, the United States, but also Mexico. And I don't distinguish between populism of the right and populism of the left. They are both equally dangerous. And Brazil, and about five or six other Latin American countries, and much of Asia now is ruled by populists, whether it is Modi in India, whether it's Xi in China, Vietnam, and so many, the Philippines. Populism is here to stay, and it will check the power that we think that we can exert through the ballot box. So if we think that we can just go into business as usual, I think that's not realistic. We ought to rethink the whole thing. 
The final thing I'm going to say, the parting thought, is that in most worthwhile projects, by worthwhile I mean difficult projects, such as the European project, or trying to resolve the issues around you know, migration, asylum, etc., and borders, and all of these difficult issues, you require both poets and plumbers. And I'd like you to ask yourselves, I'm not going to, you know, sort of, you know, play the game of me suggesting this and that and the other thing. Do you know who the poets and who the plumbers are going to be in the years ahead in Europe? And can they work in tandem? Because only if they can work in tandem can we make tangible progress. Thank you very much for putting up with me. Thank you very much. Uh, we have also with us as uh, our fourth panelist, uh, Madame Kivignemi. I just want to stress how much uh, the presence of Madame Kivignemi, as well as of uh, Prime Minister Libanon yesterday uh, morning, embodies the support that uh, the Finnish presidency and Finland more in general have, be, have been given since the beginning to this endeavor and the importance that Finland as a member state and as a member state holding the presidency is attaching to events like this one. We thank you very much for your presence and we're going to listen very carefully to your assessment of what has been done during these 36 hours. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for the invitation. Happy to be here today and it's a bit difficult to be the last speaker in the final session. I don't think that there is not uh, something uh, which uh, haven't been said during these two uh, days, but in any case I want to deliver my uh, remarks. I worked with these migration issues during my years at the OECD as I think almost everyone did uh, because those were the uh, uh, very a hectic years so when the refugee flows uh, arrived in uh, Europe and we of course from the OECD side uh, in those days uh, tried to uh, also uh, provide our support to the EU and uh, member countries uh, in order to handle with the issue and improve uh, the system. But this seminar really is uh, needed uh, in order to discuss and analyze the challenges uh, which the common European asylum system uh, faces. And I think that many of you have already stated and said uh, here that uh, more needs to be done uh, to make the CEAS uh, more efficient, harmonized and uh, stable. And it really has been a difficult journey. Public opinion surveys still find that the public, including migrants themselves, do not have full confidence in governments and EU's capacity to, ma to manage uh, migration and ensure successful integration. Progress in migration management on both the national and international front remains abstract for many people who often feel overwhelmed with conflicting messages and impressions on refugees and migration. So it's therefore very important to rebuild trust in migration policies and institutions. And I think that is one of the reasons why we are here today. Fears about migration must be addressed by using a balanced and facts-based discourse. Leadership in this case means addressing the challenges that do exist, not echoing the fears of ill-informed prejudice. And it is really difficult to ensure that conversations around migrations are based upon facts and evidence. It's uh, very difficult to uh, fight uh, against uh, fake news and populism, but the only solution is really to try to provide uh, as much uh, information as needed, uh, deliver uh, it, and of course media plays here a big role, but also the EU institutions and member countries could perform better. The common European asylum system is far from pre being perfect, but during the years also a lot has been achieved. The current state of the system, but also the failures and future steps could be communicated better. But there is also a certain need uh, to go back to basics, because unfortunately a majority of the European public, for example, doesn't feel well informed about immigration and integration 
Surveys still show that the public thinks there are far more migrants than there really are. And half of all Europeans think there are more undocumented migrants in their countries than those legally present. And the real figure is much lower. It is essential, of course, also to spell out the potential benefits of migration more clearly. For example, when some argue that recent years large refugee flows will be very costly because immigrants displace native workers and come to EU countries for social benefits, but there is, as we know, solid evidence that this is not the case. The OECD's migration report from last year showed that in most cases, fears about the impact of refugees on jobs in EU countries are simply at odds with the facts. Indeed, the analysis suggests that the labour market impact of the recent refugee inflow will be small and concentrated. In Europe as a whole, the increased inflow of refugees in 2015-16 is projected to enlarge the labour force by no more than 0.4% by December 2020. But in some countries, however, the impact is expected to be much higher. Austria, Germany, Sweden will experience an increase of up to 0.8%. Since finding a job takes time, the impact on the host country labour force will initially materialize more in an increase in unemployment than in employment. And improving labor market integration is thus critical since employment affects many other dimensions of refugee social integrations. Employers have a very important role to play in this respect as well as better recognition of qualification is needed. But we also have to be very honest uh, when informing the public there are both winners and losers associated uh, with migration. And uh, migration can be beneficial overall, but some groups such as the unskilled may be faced with increased competition in the labor market if many unskilled migrants enter a country. And these reports to which I referred already showed that in Austria and in Germany, the segment of young, low educated men could swell by 15%, and that is a rather large. Uh, increase. But really integration is the key and although many countries have made progress in this respect, many challenges remain. The integration of refugees is most difficult largely because many of them are low skilled and it takes about 20 years for refugees in Europe to achieve employment rates similar to those of other migrant groups and we all know that this is far too long. Early integration, tailored measures, and access to services have to be guaranteed. And I also want to underline the fact that integration is a joint effort, because failed national integration have knock-on effects in other countries. It's all too easy and too common to turn on the television and see a magnified, sometimes sensationalized version of poor integration. And this fuels fears shifts the migration discourse and undermines balanced debate on the relevant issues. And EU support joint action with member countries as well as global cooperation is needed uh, when it comes to integration. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> reliable fact-based information on many aspects of migration, refugees or integration is not only needed to counter fake news and make public understand better too uh, that the outcomes of the refugee flows and migration in general, but to help us all understand how to perform better. Knowing how many, who, where from and where is obviously not sufficient to make migration a powerful engine of our economies and a positive element of our societies. And we need to know more about the what and the how. Evaluation, evaluating and analyzing the current system of CEAS and integration of refugees in member countries is utmost important in order to find out what works and what doesn't. And that's why, for example, CISOVAL project is utmost uh, important. Also, more surveys and evidence is needed, especially in those areas where it's lacking. For example, Despite the relevance for migration and integration policy, 
empir empirical evidence on integration effects from family migration is largely absent. Quantitative approaches that cover several countries appear to be missing altogether, and the paucity of evidence therefore contrasts with the prominence of recent debates on family reunification. The situation doesn't make it easier for the European countries to deal with large numbers of requests for family reunification made uh, by recently uh, arrived refugees. But also in this respect, uh, the migration outlook of the OECD, which was uh, published a month ago, brings some new evidence on what works and what doesn't. The survey showed that delays in family reunification may actually have adverse consequences for migrant integration in the long term. And for example, spouses whose arrival is delayed have, longer, have lower language skills than those who were able to reunify quickly. And delay is also associated with a lower employment probability. And there are also negative effects on children. Children who arrive later are less uh, likely uh, to finish the tertiary education. So the survey also finds a positive effect on migrants' parental employment when their parents, that is the grandparents' generation, are in-house. So these findings are, as well as other studies, should be looked at very thoroughly by the EU policymakers as well as member states. It's important to base the decisions on facts and best practices, also in those cases where evidence very clearly shows that policies should be heavily reformed in a way which does at least in the short run face a lot of resistance from the public. So ladies and gentlemen, I really hope that the new Commission and European leaders will take bold decisions uh, to make uh, the common European asylum system more efficient, harmonized, and stable, so that Europe as a whole emerges stronger economically, socially, and politically. Thank you. Well, OK, I don't know if I'm going to speak from the podium, because I was not formerly a panelist. But let me simply share with you a few thoughts at the end of this uh, last uh, concluding session. Uh, when we were preparing this conference, together with the organizers, we had a fear. And that is to say that the debate would be completely hijacked by what, by what has happened since 2015, 2016. Although the very reason why we took the, the time to organize this was to look back to the development over 20 years of a common migration policy or a common approach of migration. And of course, not only looking back for the sake of looking back, but also drawing some lessons uh, for the future. At the end of this session, I can say on behalf of the organizer that we are reassured about this. That thanks to the quality of the background document, thanks to the quality of your contribution, and as reflected by the individual reports that you've heard during the previous session, we exactly stick to that line. Yes, indeed, the 2015-2016 crisis was an accelerator, not necessarily in the right direction, by the way, but we were able to assess what has happened in the framework of what was there before and, and what has been built uh, since uh, temporary. Now, the next question is, of course, how relevant is it still today to refer to temporary? Uh, I, would not, uh, I could not but quote uh, for Prime Minister Lebanon yesterday uh, morning. Uh, when temporary was drafted, we did not know that we would have 9-11, and we did not know that we would have had Syria, just to take an example. And that, of course, should temporary be, had to be redrafted today, it would not be drafted the same way. That is absolutely self-evident. <laughs> Now, I think that we should take the milestones for what they are. Because, I mean, many of you during your intervention and also in the paper, I mean, systematically referred to the relevance of these milestones since 20 years after. Here, I could not refrain to quote, uh, I mean, you know that I've been involved in humanitarian aid for the last six years of my career in the Commission, a very prominent person in the area of humanitarian aid, i.e. Peter Maurer, the president of the International Committee of the Red uh, Cross. 
Humanitarian aid and humanitarian people, professional, like to posture themselves as principles. Humanitarian based is, uh, aid is based on fundamental principles which are enshrined in the treaty and which are enshrined in the document called the European Consensus on Humanitarian Aid. And what Peter Morrow says about this principle is very relevant as far as the milestones of temporary are concerned. They, he said the principles are like the horizon. The more you walk to the, towards the horizon, the further away it seems, but it is not a reason not to keep on walking towards the principle or towards this arrival. I think that we should approach our relation with the temporary milestone uh, that uh, way. Now, many things were said during the, at least the sessions that I attended, and I cannot refrain but quote some of these uh, statements, and sorry for the other ones, but I was not physically present for the other, other sessions. Uh, I felt that there was a hidden and sometimes vocally expressed expectation that now the time has come for the EU institution to divert its energy towards other priorities. I mean, uh, the uh, Green Deal, uh, the digitalization of our societies, an equitable social transition, the new multiannual financial framework, which, which is going to be the priority of next year. So that migration issues could be dealt with in a somewhat less emotional way. It resonates with one of the statements that was abundantly retreated yesterday from Professor uh, Gibril Fahl, who said only one policy line, no policies and just but implementation. No new policies, but just but implementation. Fine, but however, Antonio Vittorino reminded us in his intervention that we would actually have no breathing space because there would be another crisis and that the new crisis, the crisis to come, was around the corner. Many are also of the view that, after all, the uh, ingredients of the 2015-2016 crisis are there, and that similarly to the situation within the Eurozone, because many parallelism could be drawn between the migration crisis and the Eurozone crisis, all the, I mean, we are still in a very weak position, and that the situation is, between inverted commas, definitely not under uh, control. Moreover, as amply demonstrated by the debate about Schengen that you referred to Madame Fayon this morning, I was quite impressed by this session. Uh, emotions has served as a breeding ground, and I will quote Hugo Brady, for anger. And that the position uh, within the Council and between the more member states are more entrenched than ever uh, for the time being. But one thing is for sure, and I would, and I would join uh, uh, Dimitri in what he said, is that public opinions will not forgive any failure to provide an appropriate answer to migration question, whatever it takes. Appropriate does not mean abiding to populist uh, discourse and analysis. It means also going to the people with a new narrative, going to the people with facts and not figure and not perceptions. And I, I know that part, it's a, it was said by Julio Di Bazio yesterday afternoon, migration handling is more about figure, uh, perception than figure, but that we have some time to bring the people back to figures and let, that's also the responsibility of the political leader and that's what political leadership means. I mean, bringing people perception closer to the uh, reality. On the top of that, we should by no means underestimate the totally perverse consequences of what is happening inside the EU today to our relation with our so-called partners. Uh, Demetri will know what I'm referring to. Uh, I will quote someone uh, attending the Transatlantic Dialogue on Migration that uh, he chaired and he convened two days ago, uh, two weeks ago, I'm sorry. I have sometimes the feeling that our partnership with third countries is more about managing mistrust. And the best way to manage mistrust for us would be to get our house in order and to behave. I would then quote uh, Ima Vasquez in her intervention uh, yesterday concerning the relation with third countries. The level of violence against migrants has reached, I mean, uh, is speaking everywhere. And it's absolutely intolerable. And it was again reflected by the presentation of UNDP uh, yesterday. I mean, uh, 
limiting the violence the migrants are, are, are victim of does not mean changing policies. I mean, a sovereign state can say to, every, to anybody, any third country nationals, I'm sorry, dear sir, dear madam, I don't want you to stay one minute more on my territory because you are not allowed to stay on my territory. But you can say that and possibly implement that without depriving that person of food, without putting his children uh, in a detention uh, center, or his or her children, I'm sorry, uh, or uh, without depriving him or her of basic health care. It's about, I mean, behaving and by doing so, showing by example and rebuilding trust with our partners, which will be willing to actually engage uh, with us. Uh, now, okay, uh, where does that lead us to? Uh, I must say, uh, <laughs> I had a dream. Uh, and I will build that on this famous migration pact, uh, which, uh, which, I mean, raises many questions. And I will also build on what you said, Hugo, this morning about uh, the way the European Council is functioning. And you said very rightly, I mean, we have now a new generation of leaders. I mean, they don't know each other and they don't know this is, is issue. Now, uh, having had the privilege, I mean, it's age, of being physically present 20 years ago in Tampere, what was the main, what was for me one of the hidden lessons of Tampere? There were relatively little controversy about the text of the uh, milestones themselves. I remember that uh, we did not manage to convince President Chirac that we should keep the single European asylum system reference. It moved to common European asylum system, so be it. But for the rest, they were not heated discussion. But what matters is that these big guys spend one day and a half uh, in a remote but nice uh, 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 Finnish city that some of you will visit uh, this afternoon, discussing just but just this enormous affairs, things that have been for them until now completely alien. So should not we think about something of that kind? You know, uh, Blair tried also in its, in its day having this Ditchley Park uh, meeting, where during next year's, and after all, there is a succession of presidents in next year, Croatia and Germany, which is a good one uh, to, 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 to achieve that. I mean, we would try, or some people, together with the Commission, aiming at having its new migration pact, of having preparing this kind of deep dive, informal deep dive into, OK, what do we actually want to achieve with regard to migration? Because pretending that we have a migration, common migration policy means that we also agree on common objectives. These objectives might be the same as the ones in, in temporary. They might differ, but okay, let's at least do that. And by preparing that event, let us try to rebuild this trust, which is obviously very absent between member states. Because there is one thing is for sure, and you will allow me to end up with a sentence in French, La confiance, ça ne, ça, ça ne se décrète pas, ça se construit. And by doing so, maybe we'll prepare the future of Europe for the younger member of the audience who is there, who has been very quiet, and who will be still proud to be European 20 years from now. Thank you very much. What a closing panel. Uh, my husband has been teaching my children, now adults and now grandchildren, that you have to give credit when it's due. And so, in Finnish, pardon me first, no oliko se hyvä? Ei ollut. Erittäin hyvä. Was it good? No, it wasn't good at all. It was excellent, exceptionally good. And this is what I felt. Thank you for all of our panelists and Jean-Louis for your excellent final words. I think that sort of sums up what we have been doing here. Uh, we prepared well the papers, and the papers hopefully will have a life of their own later that will have an impact. Marie will say more about that later. But uh, we had every session people experts from various fields. And we not just had the commission, we had commission, and I'm really glad, as Henrik said, thank you for all the commission members for coming here, accepting our invitation, and having the commission view there. Uh, I hope that you have also found it helpful, learned something, and we learned from you how it is to be at the top and try, and it's often commission is 
criticized the Commission this and we here in the Member States. So we tried to get all of us together. And for this final panel, thank you that we got the European Parliament here, the political side from that end. EMN, who is the technical organizer here, we work through in this triangle, Member States, Parliament and Commission. And people say that's why it's so, so slow. But look at us, we are still here, and once you do something, it's gone through all the mill with all these three together, and when, when the compromise is there, then it comes to the implementing. We see that perhaps in the field of migration, the implementation is where it's still lacking, perhaps more than in some other areas. That's why the time, you know, conference like this, and uh, it is not just a conference that ends here and say, yes, it wasn't a good conference, it was exceptionally good. And I invite our uh, two co-organizers, uh, the Odysseus Network, Lillian and Marie, to come here together. I, I think we should stand here, the three of us together, to show that we are in this together. I will give the technical closing words with some information that you need to know. Yes. But uh, first, Odysseus through Lillian Turdi. Yes, and I should stress that I'm standing in today for Professor Philip de Breuker, who is the founder and coordinator of the Odysseus Academic Network and who has worked tirelessly for an entire year for this conference, together with our partners, EMN and EPC. And a lot of uh, what has uh, come through has to do with his vision. So even if he could not be with us in the end through force majeure, I think that we should all consider his contribution into bringing this through. He is listening in. I would also like to thank the members of the Odysseus Network, many of whom you saw acting as rapporteurs, having presented background papers or as uh, panelists and uh, discussants, and also uh, our team, uh, Nicole Bosmans, our secretary, and our trainees, uh, Bene and Roman, who have worked a lot uh, also behind the scenes uh, to bring through this uh, event and the contribution of Odysseus. So this conference is also one of the annual policy conferences of the Odysseus Academic Network and we were thinking with Philippe that we were very happy to see again this mix of practitioners, policy makers, governments, academics, civil society coming together to debate uh, on issues of asylum and migration. And this process was reflected also in the series of preparatory workshops that we organized jointly as, as partners that took place in Brussels between June and September, where each of these background notes that we discussed here at the conference uh, was actually tested and discussed with uh, a small group of a mix of practitioners, policy makers, uh, academics, and their feedback is also integrated in, in this paper. So it is a true process of co-creation, and this is something that we would like to continue to do, this mode of working with the Odysseus uh, Academic uh, Network. So next up, uh, in terms of Odysseus events, will be our, our summer school, which will be a 20th anniversary of the summer school, combined also with the 20th anniversary of the existence of the Odysseus Network. So we coexist with the, the, the policies, uh, if you will, since we're also celebrating uh, Tampere here. So this will be in the beginning of July and we will be debating with our members later today at two in Veranda One, for all of you that need to be there, uh, how exactly uh, to organize this event, but this will be the next event from our side. Thank you.
before I express my gratitude, which is, which is very extensive, uh, maybe a quick also follow-up to Lilian's point. Uh, so we've usually benefited from the uh, roundtables that preceded this conference, and we will not stop after this conference. As I mentioned before, this is really uh, meant to be a process of dialogue, of, of input from various sources. Um, what is coming next in terms of the output of the conference is that we will rework the papers. Uh, we will bundle them together in a publication. Uh, that publication will be launched at some point in December in Brussels, and we will, of course, keep you informed. Uh, and then we look forward uh, to continued activities and conversations uh, about what has come out of this, uh, I would say, re remarkable day and a half. Uh, what we ultimately hope to do with this, of course, and, and where the activities closely linked to uh, the European Policy Centre's mission and, and the migration programme within that is to um, feed well-informed opinions and recommendations into the policy making and into the thinking on the EU's migration uh, agenda. Moving over to uh, the more important bit, uh, my uh, thank you to, and the thanks indebted to uh, a large variety of people and organizations. I want to start off by echoing uh, Lilian's words before and express a very sincere thank you and gratitude to Philippe uh, for his tremendous investment in uh, making this conference and the processes around it, uh, the success that uh, it has been. Uh, I also want to, on behalf of EBC, really uh, thank the background note authors who have invested such uh, an enormous effort and, and so much of their time. Uh, and these notes, I think, were absolutely the backbone to our discussions and have enabled us to have the level of discussion uh, that we uh, were hoping for. Um, words of sincere gratitude also to Jean-Louis de Brouwer, who is now sitting modestly over there. Uh, you've seen him um, appearing in the conference. He's uh, given us some very thought-provoking uh, comments just now. Jean-Louis is part of our organizing committee and has provided absolutely invaluable uh, guidance throughout. And I think without that guidance, we, we might have steered of course here and there, but uh, luckily he was there to, to keep us on track. Uh, big thank you as well to Olivia and Alberto, my dear colleagues from EPC who have worked very, very hard, uh, including early morning wake-up calls, particularly these last days, to, to make this a success. And last but not least, uh, our, a big thank you first to the Finnish presidency, evidently for enabling all of this, and then more specifically to our colleagues uh, from EMN Finland, Kielo, Rafael and Rina, who have set up a conference and provided also background thinking that I think have really surpassed uh, what we imagined that we were going to be able to achieve when we first started talking about this in uh, January. Uh, to end, I think, on behalf of EPC, I would like to say that for me and, and for us, this has been collaboration at its best. Mm -hmm. I think we've been able to achieve something together that none of the organizations, at least not us, uh, nor of the persons involved, would have been able to achieve uh, single-handedly. Mm -hmm. So thank you sincerely to, to the partners and, and to, you, to you all for coming. At the beginning, we were even told, who cares about Tampere? <laughs> you do. <laughs> and the spirit of Tampere that is here. And it, it has been very tangible uh, in that all these sessions, as I said, we have not just been rhetoric, <laughs> have we? No, we have, it's not just been rhetoric, we have actually discussed and tackled the issues that matter and that are difficult with the hope that now we can do something more and let's hope that these papers are the first step towards, towards this, uh, in a, in, maybe in a modest sense in a way how the Tampere conclusions have influenced the migration issues in the EU. Also for my own team, our, our newest member, Rina, conference participants know what her role has been. It's just, what shall I do on Monday? Well, there are a lot of receipts from you. Please send them her way quickly. <laughs> Make her life easier. One logistic point. But, uh, and also, 
our very youngest member's mother here. Thank you, Jutta, for coming. She's an EMN member who couldn't resist. She asked, can I bring the baby with me? <laughs> of course you can. And this is, this is also a professional uh, uh, thing for all of us who are here, professional development. I said, you need to come. Thank you. Uh, Croatian presidency was already mentioned, and I have been asked to send a little uh, invitation. Dear all, please let me use this opportunity to announce the EMN conference during the Croatian presidency on the Council of the European Union. The Croatian EMN presidency conference will be held on the 12th and the 13th of May 2020 in Zagreb, focusing on the East Mediterranean route. The conference will try to give a general insight into the East Mediterranean road and irregular migration with the focus on migrant smuggling and the aspect of human rights. We use this opportunity to invite you all to participate in the conference. Do not hesitate to contact me, Ivana Perlic Glamonchak. But you will find this information on the EMN uh, EU level website if you want to. Now, I also, we don't, some of you might go to Croatia, but others who are present here will soon be going to Tampere. So, practical information to those who are going to the Tampere side event, the bus leaves at 14.15 from the K3 exit, which is not on the Mannerheim Street side that you came in, but from the back side of the building. And those of you who have luggage with you, beware, there's a, a flight of steps you have to take down. But 14-15 uh, on the third and last side. So enjoy your time in Tampere and enjoy your lunch. Once again, a big applaud for all of you here. <laughs>